Okay, welcome to the TCT AP LP Valves 2020 virtual meeting and to the highlight session for Valve session. We have an exciting um, faculty and uh, even more exciting topics in uh, about one hour. We almost cover or supposed to cover everything. Uh, so be welcome and uh, I hope you will be enjoying each individual session. Alan, are you introducing the speakers then? Sure. Thank you, Eberhard. Uh, welcome to everyone as well. So um, today we have a, a very esteemed uh, group of discussants with us and start with the Jinmin um, An, Dr. An uh, from um, uh, Assam Medical Center, but he's actually in California close by to me, even though I've not seen him too many times because of COVID. And we have uh, obviously uh, Dr. David Cohen from, um, Minnesota, from Missouri, Kansas City, and Dr. Kentaro, um, I had Shashida from Keo University, uh, Dr. James E from, um, I'm not sure I've seen James yet, but he hopefully will join from St. Paul in Columbia. And, um, and I think that will be our discussion. Our uh, speaker said to, to start with uh, is Dr. Samir Kapadia from the Cleveland Clinic. And he'll be talking about the future trend in TAVR, the remaining hurdles. Um, Samir? Thank you very much. Uh... I'll start my presentation by, I start my presentation. I want to say that the change is real. So if you look at the thoracotomy and uh, closed incision versus doing it transcatheter, mainly transfemoral access is now a reality. Before I go to what are the hurdles, I thought that I'll just for uh, two minutes say, where do we stand at this point in time? Of course, as you see that the low risk partner trial was published uh, now, it appears for a long time ago, but it is all, uh, just a uh, year and a half ago. And what we found was amazing that if you look at 30 day and one year outcomes of not just death and stroke, but anything else, everything was better with transcatheter aortic valve, maybe except for the left corner branch block uh, that was more common uh, with the with the tower compared to surgery. So when we are looking at the future, what is the gold standard? Is surgery the gold standard? Or we are even going to aim for better than surgery uh, as our gold standard? My personal opinion, we should aim for better than surgery because this will become apparent when we look at a lot of different things because whatever the bleeding complication to surgery are is definitely not the gold standard for tower or same way for AKI or for uh, that matter, even stroke. Where do we stand at this time? We started with, uh, this is our Cleveland Clinic uh, hybrid room. Uh, we used to have a lot of people in the hybrid room, and now we have very few people, you know, including a cardiologist and echo technician. Uh, we do have a pump available, but no swan gans, no general anesthesia, no foley, no art line. And if you look at this uh, access, with these days, we do the access just on one side with the same artery, uh, twice. Uh, so just put the uh, large sheath on the top, bar, bottom sheet small, uh, sentinel access, and a uh, access for the pacemaker. Uh, and then uh, when we put the sentinel in all the patients currently, uh, and when the, we deploy the valve, we typically deploy the valve in an RAO cardio projection uh, where uh, we try to put the valve at zero, uh, meaning less than one millimeter below. Uh, the non core cusp. Uh, we use this uh, radiolucent line to line it up, and we use a straight flush catheter rather than a pigtail catheter. Uh, we do it in a biplane so you can check it. We do echocardiography and geography and assessment of the AR, and I know Dr. Sirois is going to talk about uh, this particular issue uh, in the next session, but again, hemodynamics and geography and echocardiography are all critical to have no uh, aortic regurgitation at the end. And we have some fancy ways to look at the, the either the AR index or even the dichotic notch, how high it should be. And if it's more than 50% higher, then there's less likely to be AR. And at the end, we pull the pacemaker and rapidly pace the right atrium to see if there is any conduction delay at 120 beats per minute. If there is no conduction delay, we discharge the patient the same day. So we are discharging all our tower patients the same day. And then at the end, we use uh, just manual pressure, uh, take a picture from the bottom sheath, 
if the sheath looks okay, then we just use manual pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to hold and uh, patient is discharged. Last year, we did 720 patients uh, with 60% high risk, 40% intermediate risk. 90% uh, of the patients were transfemoral and all of them with conscious sedation. And we had no mortality, once two strokes, 0.3% AR and new pacemaker, only 1.2%. So this is amazing in the sense that we are able to do all these things. So what are really the hurdles for the future? So currently we have, as you know, in the United States, three valves, the Lotus valve, the Evolute, and the S3 Ultra uh, nowadays. Uh, and uh, we do have Portico coming up and we have another two valves, the Accurate and the Giena valve uh, in clinical investigation. What are the hurdles? So the patient and device selection, bicuspid valve, young patient, and I'll discuss this very briefly in the next few minutes, uh, stroke prevention, minimizing uh, the left bundle branch block and durability of the valve. So if you look at the bicuspid valve as, and all of this can be discussed as an individual lecture, but I thought that I'll just highlight a few things. So there is a new classification that is not that new, uh, but a consensus document that you may want to look at to say that what are the, you know, is a fused bicuspid valve, two sinuses bicuspid, or the partial fusion of the bicuspid valve. And the idea is that uh, the fused bicuspid valves uh, have a rafe, uh, the two sinuses have two sinuses, and partial fusion has small rafe. How do we size it? A lot of different uh, opinions about sizing. I personally like to size it in the annulus, or some people say that they size it about the annulus, they size it, there are a lot of different methods. The LIDA plane method is one of them to say that you measure the uh, leaflet lens and then try to come up with the area. Uh, and then how high you place the device is another option. Again, placing it at zero uh, at the annular level is not an unreasonable uh, opinion. How about the young patients? This is another challenge. So if you are a 60 year old person, should we do tower, tower and tower as you get older, or you should do tower followed by tower followed by tower. And again, there's a lot of uh, literature coming out that if you have tower valve and if you have to do tower to remove the valve, how easy it is, how difficult it is, what, are, what is involved, whether you have to replace the root or not, or you do tower as a first option, remove the calcified valve, then do tower, then do tower. So these are all unanswered questions. Valve in valve, I know Dr. Webb is going to talk about in the next lecture, but I just put for the controversial part that, uh, you know, uh, Danny DeVille presented this at the uh, Euro PCR to say that five-year outcomes were not as good as expected. Again, interestingly enough, if you look at the page, people with more than 20 gradient or less than 20 gradient, there was no difference. And if you look at the small versus large, there was a difference, but the difference was relatively uh, small. Coronary access is another question. You know, this is our very old first patient uh, where we had an occlusion of the coronary artery and we could revascularize the patient. Uh, but if you look at what we learned is that a small sinus is uh, if, the, if uh, the left main is low origin uh, and if the valve is not oriented correctly, uh, there is a better chance of closing the coronary uh, rather than not. So basilica procedure is one of the procedures where we go in and tear the leaflet, the left coronary leaflet, uh, with the snare can be done. Yeah, I think so. I'm sorry that uh, it has a sound in it. But again, there are several steps to the procedure. And if you look at all these several steps, you can tell that the procedure is complex, but can be, can be done uh, safely. However, if you look at the most recent data, it says that the mortality of the procedure is 1.6%. If you do double basilica, it's 25%. Stroke rate is 6.4% and 9%. Uh, so this is a fairly uh, morbid and a dangerous sounding procedure in a lot of places. For us, I probably have done 10 cases and none of them had any of this kind of major uh, adverse events. But again, this is, a, this is, a, this is uh, something that needs uh, further work. Stroke. Whether the stroke, you know, compared to sour, we are better with sour, but is it enough? Uh, is it enough to say that our stroke rate of 2.2% is reasonable or not? And that is what the TVT registry shows, that two, stroke rate is 2.2%. 2 
And if you look at the hospital mortality, mortality is still high. So it's 12.7% mortality uh, with any stroke in the United States. And 30-day mortality is 16%. So this is not a minor complication. And Sentinel was one of the trials that we did. We, sh we showed that there was a stroke rate was reduced, again, from 8 to 3%. 8% is not commonly seen. The reason is that we did MRI, and these were mostly minor strokes. So now we are doing the protected tower study, which is 2,600 patients, randomizing them with the emboli protection versus none to look at clinical endpoints uh, for this trial. Left bundle branch block, again, uh, if you look at the pacemaker, this is a very busy slide, but just for people's reference, that there's so many variables uh, that decide whether you're going to have need for pacemaker or not, including the valve types, but also how low you put, what are the what are the events and things like that. Durability of the valve is the last point that I want to make sure that uh, we discuss at some point. So again, in the partner sub-study, there are several different definitions of uh, HALT uh, or uh, the leaflet mobility. Uh, again, how much of the leaflet is affected uh, is important to know. But if you look at the death stroke and TIA with HALT or no HALT, uh, seven to one year, seven days to 30 days, and 30 days to one year. Uh, if you look at it, although statistically they are not significant, there appears to be a signal that there may be an event associated. Uh, this is both for tower and sour combined, uh, that there is, uh, there may be uh, a, a penalty to pay uh, for these events. However, halt comes and goes. So when you look at these patients at 30 days and one year, several of these patients who had halt at 30 days did not have it uh, one year. So this is again uh, something that is very important to uh, understand in the future that how we are going to treat it or how we are going to prevent it. Again, if you look at the gradients, the gradients were also statistically not significantly different, but again, it appears that there may be a signal if we follow these patients uh, longer. Uh, this is just one year follow. Uh, so that duration is not known. Anticoagulation may help all or not. Again, as you will discuss the Galileo trial, but Galileo trial was negative. Atlantis trial is ongoing. Anticoagulation for valve in valve is necessary uh, or not. We don't know that. Uh, no acquisis coumadin is good or not. We don't know that and treatment of a halt, how do we treat them and how long we'll treat them is also unknown. There are several new trials that we are doing and are ongoing, the early tower uh, to look at patients asymptomatic with severe AS, unload LV, again, to look at people with poor EF and moderate AS, watch towers, tower plus watchmen. Uh, we are almost uh, completed enrollment of 312 patients and we are just on the follow phase and protected tower, as I discussed, uh, with the central uh, in tower. So thank you again for your attention. And uh, I know it is a little faster presentation, but uh, hopefully helpful. Thank you, uh, Samir. Um, so I think you know, we're gonna have the discussion at the end. So if uh, everybody can hold their questions or mark their questions and we can come back to Samir later. Uh, so our next uh, lecturer is uh, gonna be uh, Dr. John Webb from Vancouver. He's gonna talk about Bob and Bob Tavern challenges and solutions, uh, John. Okay, so I'm going to talk about aortic valve uh, and valve implantation, just a very brief overview. There's my uh, disclosures. Now, you know, we have a lot of data now, uh, both from the uh, uh, sapien literature and from the uh, uh, core valve evolute literature showing excellent outcomes with valve and valve implants. We reported the one-year one year outcomes in a large series uh, several years ago. We now have three-year follow-up for both series and five-year follow-up coming out very shortly. I'll just show you. The, the partner two valve and valve data, and this is really replicated, I think, pretty much in the, with the uh, evolute and core valve data as well. Hemodynamic function improves dramatically. Um, aortic insufficiency largely resolves. You really don't have any aortic insufficiency after this procedure unless you make some kind of mistake and displace the valve. Functional improvements are really very dramatic with this therapy, uh, both in, no matter how this is evaluated. Now, we now have a large number of studies which have looked at valve and valve tower and high risk patients. Vivid, Partner 2, Core Valve US, Viva, and TBT. And uh, just to look at the two major ones with the balloon expandable and self-expanding supraannular valve, there you can see the outcomes are fairly similar. There's, there's currently a coronary obstruction risk of a little less than 1%, much lower than in the earlier Vivid registry with increased experience. Of course, we don't see annular rupture. 
paravalvular leak is not a major problem uh, with uh, this procedure. Loose pacemaker rates are relatively low, although interesting, a little bit higher with the uh, core valve experience, even though there is a, a valve ring, perhaps because of low implantation, the early experience, and mortality is very similar. It's interesting, if you look at the uh, mean gradient across the procedure in partner two and core valve US, you can see that they're almost identical in terms of mean gradient after procedure in that early experience, perhaps again, due to low implantation. Now, now in terms of uh, the overall experience, here's some data from the US TBT registry, just looking at outcomes with uh, uh, valve and valve uh, versus native valve tower. And there you can see that really outcomes are really much better with valve and valve implantation. We were afraid of this in the early days. I think now when I know that I have a valve and valve implant, I immediately think, oh, I've got an easy case coming up and the results tend to be better. This is quite different than we expected in the early days. Now we do know that we do much better with larger surgical valves and with small valves. We have this data from, uh, from Danny DeVere from some years ago suggesting this. And we do know that severe PPM is a bad thing, even with valve and valve implants, outcomes are not as good for whatever reason, whether it's truly because of uh, the gradient is not entirely clear, but it's obviously an issue. And we do know that the valves tend to be relatively durable, at least up to three years. Now, later on, uh, it, it seems highly likely that they won't be as durable as a native aortic valve disease because of under expansion of these valves, but we have three-year data, and I have to tell you the five-year data is looking fairly favorable from the two uh, uh, North American registries as well. This will be presented fairly soon. In terms of late follow-up, at least with the uh, valve and valve implant with the Sapien valve, you can see that it's interesting that it really wasn't clear that valve size or residual gradient had much to do with late outcome. In fact, it, it really just wasn't predictive, but we know it does have something to do with this. We do know that mild to moderate PPM doesn't really seem to matter. I don't know if you can see there, but when you look at severe PPM, clearly that does uh, pretend a poor late prognosis, although interestingly still have good functional benefit even in those patients, it seems, when you look at it hard. Now, one of the lessons we've learned is the importance of, of implanting these valves high. Here's very early experience with the Sapien XT valve, and there you can see on the right, a 50-50 implant, which was how actually implantation was re recommended by some centers in the very early days of the PP2 uh, registry. We now know you really have to implant high if you want to have optimal opening of your valve. And this is true regardless of a balloon expandable or super annular valves, they have to be implanted relatively high. Here's an illustration of in vitro testing of a, a core valve prosthesis with much better uh, opening of the valve on the left where it's uh, implanted supranular versus low implantation on the right. This is, I think, important to durability and to thrombosis and to PPM. So here's how you would typically implant a Sapien 3 valve today as opposed to the 50-50. This would be a pretty much ideal implant. In fact, these days we try to implant it even a little bit higher than that to get really super annular functioning of the balloon expandable prosthesis if you can implant it high enough. And we do know that optimal expansion is, is very important. Here's a, a study from our center at Dr. Seth and Nathan. There you can see a, a, a mitroflow valve uh, on top, which is which has got a safety inside it, which is clearly underexpanded and, and suboptimal opening and pinwheeling of the valve. And below, after cracking of the mitroflow prosthesis, you really have much better opening of the sapien valve. So this is clearly important if we want to optimize durability and reduce uh, uh, thrombosis. So these days, cracking has become increasingly common. On the left there, you can see a paramount valve, which has been cracked with uh, the the ring severed uh, with the sapien inside. And on the right, you can see a, uh, a uh, this isn't playing. We'll see if we can play it again. Anyway, there actually, you can see the crack right here on a paramount valve with a, with a core valve or evolute inside it. Good, okay. Here's an example of a underexpanded sapien three inside a, uh, uh, a mosaic valve, a mean gradient 30. And, more and more, we've, brought, we've learned that actually you can bring these patients back sometime after the procedure and, and, and do what you perhaps should have done the first time. Here, after cracking of the surgical valve, you have a gradient reduced down to 10 uh, three months later. So this is a possibility to bring patients back. Here's an example of a even trifecta, which is a, a surgical valve that can't be cracked because it has a, a titanium in the frame. But in fact, you can still remodel these valves. You can still stretch them a little bit. You can still push the posts out and get reduced gradient, even with this non-crackable valve, you can modify them. Here's an example 
um, of a uh, case that was re recent case at our center. This was a patient where we, we had planned to protect the left main, but the patient became unstable at the beginning of the procedure and there really wasn't time. The implant had to be done very quickly. And there you can see we have a left main occlusion. And on uh, on ECHO, there's really a, uh, a cyst with really no motion at all. ECMO was instituted. The uh, the left main was quickly rewired. There's a, uh, a a chimney stenting and LV function returned to normal really within uh, within minutes. And that patient was actually discharged a few days later with normal function. But still, we were lucky to get out of that. And there's a really significant risk of mortality with coronary occlusion. Here's another patient many years ago from our institution where the left main was uh, stented because of uh, uh, partial occlusion at the time of the procedure. And there you can see one year later, there's restenosis. And I think that really, this is not an optimal solution to this problem to stent the left main chimney stenting, that sort of thing, because restenosis is probably extremely common with the stent becoming crushed. And we really have really no reports of uh, late follow up after chimney stenting and, and uh, salvage cases. So really, I think it becomes a question of prevention for this is, is what's really important. We've really learned that the way to do this is not only angiographically screening is on the right, uh, but also CT screening, looking at the uh, valve to coronary distance uh, on top you can see uh, a valve that appears to be okay and on the bottom a valve that is not okay and uh, you know the best option I think rather than basilica really is probably just not to do the case and reconsider surgery but we'll get to that a little bit later. Here's an example of the second mechanism of occlusion not the surgical leaflets per se but the uh, tower valve leaflets implanted too high so as to cover the coronary artery and, and um, this isn't really going to be solved with uh, basilica uh, at all. Here's the other way of looking at the CT, of course, is, is, uh, is the, the VTC uh, in the uh, axial images. And there you can see on top a valve that is not gonna be okay for a TAVI and one that is gonna be okay on the bottom. So screening is very important. I think we just need to go forward. Of course, as Samir talked about, the basilica procedures become of extreme interest for this sort of issue. Uh, splitting the surgical valve uh, can be very, very helpful in some cases, but still, associated with considerable difficulty and some risk. And uh, we also have concerns with under expansion uh, uh, with regards to increased rates of HALT and, uh, and thrombotic uh, early restenosis. So more and more reasons are becoming evident for thinking about cracking surgical valves uh, at the time of valve and valve implants to reduce thrombosis risk. I think what's gonna be really important that down the road is what about TAVR and TAVR? And will this be a repeatable procedure? Uh, well, I, I think it certainly can be. Here's the redo registry, uh, uh, a multi-center registry led by Relendez from our center. And there you can see that in a very large number of patients, mean gradient falls dramatically. Virtually no aortic insufficiency with TAVR and TAVR and functional improvement is dramatic. But there still are real concerns with TAVR and TAVR in terms of coronary access and particularly coronary instruction. And the, the concern is with all valves, including the uh, sapient type balloon expandable intraannular valves, where the top of the stent may now extend over the coronaries, but even more so in superannular valves where these procedures just may not be repeatable uh, in, in some patients. And certainly I think as we move into low risk patients, we're really gonna have to think about this when we put in the first valve is will this be a repeatable procedure? Here's an example of one of our patients that had the procedure over 10 years ago, transapically mean gradient 14 and 10 years later, uh, transfemorally, a next day discharge mean gradient 14 as well. So you can see there that the coronary is still accessible uh, above the valve. And I think more and more this is going to become an issue. So that's it for uh, my very short review of valve and valve tower. Um, thank you very much, John. Um, so let's move on to our next talk by uh, Patrick Sorois. Um, he's going to talk about uh, comparative assessment of aortic regurgitation post tower um, in nine commercially available tower valves. Uh, Patrick? Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to see uh, everybody today after a long time. Uh, I'm going to say something about the comparative assessment of uh, aortic regurgitation post uh, TAVER in a commercially available uh, transcatheter heart valve. Um, you all know that aortic regurgitation after TAVER negatively impact a patient prognosis. A meta-analysis comprising over 15,000 patients show a 2.12-fold increase in mortality for a patient with more than mild 
regurgitation after TAVER, and we are also exploring the impact of mild regurgitation. Now, clearly, with the, the rise of the minimalist TAVER era, and without general anesthesia, echocardiogram evaluation during the procedure become restricted. And aortogram re-emerges as a practical and familiar tool for the interventional cardiologist. We just present at the ACC or a series of 2,400 patients, and it was published in the uh, Jack Intervention, and there was a very provocative uh, uh, editorial of Bernard Cousins, can you please ask the echocardiographer to get out of the catheterization laboratory, which is uh, quite uh, provocative. Uh, just a word about the uh, quantitative assessment of regurgitation. You perform uh, using a single aortogram with video densitometry technique. Basically, you have a, a a reference area and a region of uh, interest. You look at this uh, time density curve of the uh, reference area and the uh, region of interest and the ratio between the two area under the time density curve is translated in percentage of regurgitation. Uh, this is an action. You could see the color-coded uh, regurgitation, the assessment of the color code of video densitometry, uh, clearly uh, uh, it is at the upper part of the valve in this case. Uh, we spent some time between uh, 2016 and now to validate that in vitro, in uh, mock circulation, in animal models, uh, pigs and sheep, uh, we correlate that with uh, Transthoracic and transesophageal echo, and with uh, uh, Wahab, we look at uh, MRI. You see here an MRI with the uh, classical uh, regurgitation fraction of 33 percent, found in this case 32 percent by uh, video densitometry. Uh, this is a pretty good relationship if you think that the autogram was done after the procedure and the MRI in the place of uh, Wahab uh, within 30 days. So we were quite pleased by this uh, relationship. What is important is this value of 17%. I don't have the time to, to show you, but basically uh, looking at the transthoracic and transesophageal echo, 17% uh, was the best cutoff criteria to diagnose on echo a moderate to severe. So that number came back uh, repeatedly as the difference between mild and uh, moderate of severe on echo. And we were pleased to see that this number has an impact on prognosis. This is a, a Brazilian series with a follow-up of four years. And you see when you have a uh, regurgitation of less than 17%, your survival was at that time 68.3%. When it was above 17%, it was 39.5%. Uh, to date, little is known, as a matter of fact, about comparative quantitative and geographic assessment of aortic regurgitation clinical trials comparing transcatheter heart valve. So we thought to evaluate autogram from clinical practice uh, in a large uh, multi-center court of TAVER patient in order to determine uh, the features uh, among the ceiling features among multiple uh, commercially available uh, platform. It is a retrospective analysis, we have to say that, but from multi-center and multi-continental multi cohort. The only thing we were asking to our friend colleagues, because they are all friends, is to provide us with consecutive uh, patients uh, that underwent TAVER following each participation institution heart team recommendation. And the autogram were uh, analyzed using the video densitometric uh, technique. 
uh, offline. It's a pre-medical system, but it's now online with uh, Philips. And what is important is that we work as a totally, totally independent call-up. It is not sponsored. It's a purely uh, academic activity. You see, we had friends in Canada, Brazil, Netherlands, France, Sweden, Germany, Italy, and Japan. So all together, we had uh, 4,329 TAVER cases in 115 patients. There were no final aortogram performed. Among these 4,214 aortogram, without uh, acquisition protocol, prospective acquisition protocol, a sizable number were non-analyzable because they were an overlap of the descending aorta with the region of interest, the outflow tract, so deep breathing, breathing, overlapping of the descending aorta with the reference area, some table motion, some insufficient time of image acquisition, some radiopaque structures in the region of interest and some really insufficient contrast in the aortic roof. But we end up with uh, 2,400 uh, aortogram analyzed. Today in prospective series or in our first randomized trial, the acquisition is available between 95 and 98 percent. So this is what we have uh, evaluated, uh, a lot of Lotus, Core Valve, Sapien 3, Evolute R, Sapien XT, Accurate, Evolute Pro. We eliminate these uh, few Ks. We were below uh, 50 Ks, um, Direct Flow Medical, Centra, Innovar, and Lotus Edge, although we have now a large series of Lotus Edge, but not yet uh, analyzed. And we see in Europe more and more valve coming from the Far East. Here you have the My valve that we have had to the series uh, published in uh, Jack Cardiovascular Intervention last month, and also the Venus. But we have also the Taurus now, the VitaFlow uh, Microport, and the Hydra of uh, SMT. Uh, there is in Europe a lot of valve coming from the Far East, and some of them are very good. Here you see the My valve, which is coming from India, Nike Nickel Chrome, Bovine Pericardium, Balloon Expandable. They just have now the 32 uh, millimeter valve. It's still compatible with a sheet in a diameter of 14 uh, French. It has an anti leak uh, skirt and an external. Uh, pericardial wrap and it is C mark since April 2019. And then you have the Venus, which is in nitinol, self expanding, porcine pericardium supraannular, also a 32, but the sheet is about uh, 90 French and it's an anti leak skirt. This is basically the result. What you see here is the cumulative uh, curve uh, of the percentage of regurgitation uh, going here at the bottom from zero to 60 percent. Uh, this gray zone of this line is really for us the cutoff criteria between mild and moderate and severe regurgitation, it is 17 percent. As you could see with the Lotus, we have really only a few cases uh, with uh, more than 70%. The second one in purple here is the My Valve 108 case. Then there is a large cohort of Evolute R Pro Sapien 3 uh, Accurate and, uh, and Sapien XT, about 1,000 patients in this blue curve. He is a newcomer. Uh, it is the Venus uh, valve of uh, uh, De Nova. And then you have uh, an historical valve, the core valve, uh, which in uh, uh, more than uh, about 30% of the case has uh, moderate or severe regurgitation in the first generation. Usually we quantify the orthogram by non-trace less than 6%. 6 to 17 mild and above 17 moderate and severe. 
You see here the again the distribution between severe in red, uh, mild six to seventeen in blue, and in green uh, none or trace. So um, obviously the best one is the mechanical expandable of the best one is the um, the lotus. Then you have the my valve will make a very good entry in uh, in Europe with 2.9 of uh, moderate to severe. We have Evolute Pro with uh, 5.3, Sapien 3 8.3, Evolute R 8.8, .8, Sapien XT 10.9, uh, Accurate 11.3, Venus the Chinese 18.3, and historically uh, the core valve. If you look only to the balloon expandable valve, uh, we are pleased to see that the my valve made a very good entry in the European market with 6.3%, as good as the Sapien 3, 7.6%, and the Sapien XT. Uh, this was significantly different from the my valve, was the Sapien 3 was not uh, significant different with a postdoc von Ferroni uh, test. In the self-expanding, uh, in the self-expanding, uh, only the core valve is uh, different from the other. Uh, the three uh, star indicate that the Evolute R, Accurate, and Venus are not basically different from the uh, Evolute Pro. So the strength of this type of approach is that it's uh, real-world data in consecutive patients with uh, daily clinical uh, practice. Um, it's a quantitative assessment with a validate and reproducible method. There is now a few centers who has the technology either online or offline. The inter-observer correlation of that software is spectacular with a coefficient of correlation of 95%. And in the blunt Alman, the difference between two measurements is 1% with uh, um, boundaries of agreement of 4% and the same for intra-observer. And one important, important point is that it was analyzed by an independent call-up with no sponsoring of the industry. And you know, with a long, long history of trialist, I can tell you a story about the uh, call-up, uh, which are quite uh, interesting. The limitation is that uh, no randomization was performed for the valve comparison, what may inherently lead to selection bias, although it's now introduced in the randomized trial as a technique in parallel with the echo, so you get both information. It was retrospective uh, without an acquisition protocol, so the feasibility of the analysis is moderate with 41% uh, of arthrogram not analyzable for the reason that I have given you. But I can also tell you that uh, we have published a quite large uh, registry assess regurg where there is a prospective protocol and then globally the uh, analysis was feasible in 95.5% and our Japanese friend had a 100% uh, um, feasibility of analysis respecting very much the uh, separation between the descending aorta and the region of interest. Since they were not the purpose of the present report, no information regarding calcification, present of bicuspid valve, aortic annulus size, uh, shape, uh, diameter, etc. That was not the purpose, but we are now ripe, I would say, to do this kind of uh, analysis. And the final conclusion is that. So far, the lotus valve had the lowest amount of acute regurgitation post TAVE, and the first generation core valve has the highest. My valve and Venus to newcomers uh, demonstrate acceptable amount of aortic regurgitation. These objective assessments may be of great value for clinical trial, comparing different valves, 
technique of implantation and clinical scenario. And in technique of implantation, we have published uh, the regurgitation by video densitometry before and after post dilatation. Well, it was quite impressive. But of course, we have to get involved, and we are involved in these head to head uh, comparison randomized uh, study. So we will have to keep working in the field. Here they have a, a long list of uh, friends, good friends who uh, help us to collect these uh, consecutive uh, series that uh, I have presented and has been published in Jack Intervention last month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so let's move on to our final two uh, lectures. And uh, Greg Stone is going to talk about the new insights from the COAP uh, study, the patient eligibility and timing. Uh, Greg? Excellent. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure. Uh, to be able to give you uh, this talk on new insights from COAPT, including long-term results and some important subgroup results. These are my uh, disclosures. Um, most importantly, I was the principal investigator along with Mike Mack for the COAPT trial for which I was uncompensated. So as uh, you all well know by now, COAPT was a parallel controlled open label multicenter trial in 614 patients with heart failure and either three plus or four plus secondary MR as determined by an echocardiographic core laboratory before enrollment. These were patients who were still symptomatic despite maximally tolerated doses of guideline directed medical therapy and prior revascularization or cardiac resynchronization therapy as appropriate as determined by an eligibility committee. So they were symptomatic and failing best therapies, if you will. And then they were randomized one to one to either ongoing uh, guideline directed medical therapy alone or GDMT plus having their MR corrected with the mitral clip. <clears throat> now I will emphasize a few important entry criteria uh, because the results of the trial always apply to the patients enrolled. We included patients with an LVF of 20 to 50%. So sick patients mean LVF was 30%, but we didn't want patients with end stage disease. <clears throat> they also had to have a left ventricular end systolic dimension of less than seven centimeters. So we excluded patients with truly markedly dilated left ventricles. I already mentioned the true severe three plus or four plus MR according to the US ASC criteria. So these patients had a lot of mitral regurgitation, but only moderately dilated left ventricles. They had to be failing GDMT that is still symptomatic, but not bedridden, not awaiting transplant. And we did exclude patients with severe um, uh, um, uncorrectable pulmonary hypertension, moderate or severe right ventricular dysfunction, or severe tricuspid regurgitation. <coughs> so you all know the main results of this trial, which will all heart failure hospitalizations within 24 months. At two, uh, and this was markedly reduced uh, by about 50% in the mitral clip arm compared to the control arm. And this was an extremely safe procedure. Uh, we would have allowed up to 12% device-related complications within a year, and the rate was only 3.4%, which was mostly a few single leaflet um, device attachments. Perhaps most importantly, all-cause mortality was reduced uh, substantially by two years, um, an absolute difference of 17%, or number needed to treat of six patients to save one life. And you can see that in contrast to the reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and improvement in quality of life, which occurred almost immediately after reducing uh, LV volume overload by correcting MR, the reduction in mortality took more time to emerge. Um, you started to see it at about six to 12 months, and then the curves were diverging over time. Now to put these results in perspective, this number needed to treat, if you look at patients with HEFREF, that is an ejection fraction of 40% or less. Most of our class one guideline directed medical therapies, uh, you have to treat uh, for two years, uh, 20 to 50 patients to save one life. There's ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, um, aldosterone antagonists, beta blockers, etc. Whereas in the HEFREF population in COAP, you had to treat five patients to save one life. So much, much more effective than drug therapy for the right patient. 
Now, uh, we recently have reported the three-year outcomes in the COAP trial, and as you can see, the uh, overall rate of death or heart failure hospitalization continued to be reduced, and in fact, the curves continued to diverge. You can see that uh, the number needed to treat was 3.4 patients to prevent a death or heart failure hospitalization within three years, and you can see the p-value is around 12 zeros and a one. So there's just no, no possibility that this is play of chance. Now, we did allow, at beginning at two years, crossovers in the medical therapy patients that were still alive to receive a mitroclip. And there were 58 patients that did crossover. So these are now the curves with the crossover patients removed from the blue curve. Um, and you can see, if anything, it looks a little bit better. And if, for demonstration's sake, we put what happened to those mitroclip patients back to time zero, you can see in terms of death and heart failure hospitalization, they started to assume the um, event rate of the originally mitroclip treated patients. And in fact, by multivariable analysis in the medical therapy alone group, crossing over and receiving a mitroclip was associated with a 57% reduction in a time-adjusted analysis in death or heart failure hospitalization. So obviously, it's better to treat early rather than late because a lot of the patients died by the time they got to two years and had, had suffered a lot of symptoms, but it's never too late. So even if we waited two years, those patients seem to achieve a substantial benefit from crossover to the mitral clip. And now with follow-up out to 36 months, we've had no additional device-related complications. In fact, the, the true device-related complications, which are listed here, were basically all occurred within 30 days. It's only really 1.4%, and that's absolutely stable through three years. There have been no device embolizations, additional SDLAs, et cetera, um, uh, surgeries to remove the clip, uh, mitral stenosis, et cetera. Um, we also, for FDA purposes, had to include progressive heart failure, that is LVADs or heart transplants, and those tend to increase a little bit over time, but that's just reflecting the uh, progressive nature of cardiomyopathy. So a lot of these benefits um, accrued because of the reduction in mitral regurgitation. And if you look here at baseline, uh, both groups had three to four plus MR in all patients. At 30 days by core lab analysis, you can see 93% of the mitral clip group were now down to two plus or less. But interestingly, about a third of the medical therapy patients were also two plus or less. So some of them perhaps because of regression of the mean or reflecting the dynamic nature of MR um, also may have a reduction in MR. And when we looked overall at the 30-day MR grade and then what happens after 30 days to two years, you could see if you had um, at 30 days, zero to one plus MR in green or two plus MR in blue, you had relatively low rates of death or heart failure hospitalization. Whereas if the MR was three to four plus, you had a much worse prognosis. Now, this, the, the blue and the green curves were not significantly different in this study. There may be a little bit of a difference, but the biggest issue is don't have three to four plus MR. And interestingly, when we looked at the mitroclip group and the medical therapy alone group, the patterns of these curves look identical. So it really doesn't matter how the MR is reduced at 30 days, whether mitroclip or medical therapy, whatever you can do to reduce it, that's what's going to dictate the subsequent prognosis. So this really links the pathophysiology of reducing MR to the improved late outcomes. Now, interestingly, in addition to the mitroclip being better at acutely reducing MR, it was also better at sustaining a reduction in MR. So these are the patients who, was, who achieved a 30-day residual MR grade of 0 to 1 plus. And you could see this is the mitroclip group. Um, they all were less than two plus now. That's what the green is, obviously, by definition at 30 days. And you can see at 12 months and 24 months, almost all of them stay less than or equal to two plus. In contrast, if you take those 34% of patients that got to two plus or less here, you can see that um, in this case, they were all less than or equal to one plus. A substantial proportion will redevelop three or four plus MR over time. And a similar pattern occurs if you look at those who had 30-day residual MR of two plus. Um, very few mitroclip patients will then redevelop three to four plus MR during time, but substantial numbers of medical therapy patients will. So even though about a third of the medical pa therapy patients seem to have somewhat of a reduction in MR at 30 days, it's not durable in at least half the patients. 
And then finally, again, very busy slide, but the biggest difference was a huge reduction in MR severity in the CLIP group compared to control group over time. Very busy slide, but I'll just emphasize, these are the recurrence rates of three to four plus MR with the mitral clip. At 30 days, um, you can see 1.5%, uh, then 1%, then 0.6%, and 1.2%, so extremely low re recurrence rates of three to four plus MR. We also saw, of course, that the mitral clip compared to medical therapy alone substantially improved health status from this uh, um, uh, article from uh, uh, Susan Arnold and David Cohn. You can see that the benefit in terms of quality of life, this is the KCCQ overall summary score, is immediate. And the reduction is a relatively, I'm sorry, the improvement is a relatively large improvement. I put on here the minimal uh, clinically important difference of five points to show you that this is about a 12 to 15 point different, and you can see it's sustained over time. So if you look at what happened to KCCQ at one month, uh, did it improve, did it decrease? This is the change in KCCQ, and this is the medical therapy group alone arm. And of course, some people will feel better, some people will feel worse, many people will feel unchanged at 30 days. This is the distribution in the mitral clip arm at 30 days. And so you can see the curve is shifted to the right. So more patients in the mitral clip arm, of course, are feeling better at 30 days. So if you look at a large increase in KCCQ, you can see it's about three times more common with the mitral clip than it is with medical therapy. But importantly, in this manuscript, what we saw was that this early improvement in symptoms were strongly associated with freedom from death and heart failure hospitalization. So if, uh, this is a multivariable analysis, so if patients feel better at 30 days, no matter how you treat them, they're more likely to live longer and be free from heart failure hospitalization. So an important link between symptoms and subsequent heart outcomes. Now a few interesting subgroups and then I'll close. Uh, we looked at the relationship between pulmonary hypertension and outcomes, and you could see here for both the uh, medical therapy arm in blue and the mitral clip arm in green, as the pulmonary pressures increased, the uh, um, risk of death or heart failure hospitalization increased. So pulmonary hypertension, as measured by the right ventricular systolic pressure on an echo, is clearly a, an important prognostic factor for both therapies. But you can see, as you can tell from the slopes being almost identical, the mitral clip improvement of about 50% in death or heart failure hospitalization was independent of pulmonary pressure. And this is up to at least a pulmonary pressure of around 75 millimeters of mercury. So here, for example, is the medical therapy alarm, uh, arm with less than or greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. You can see, again, you go from a 55% death or heart failure hospitalization rate to 80% at two years. And you can see that both of those are concordantly reduced with mitral clip therapy uh, with an interaction p-value of 0.78. Becky Hahn looked at the impact of tricuspid regurgitation, and we similarly found the tricuspid regurgitation even moderate or greater. Uh, we didn't have many severe cases, but we had 16% with at least moderate or moderate to severe. And that also was a ne negative prognostic factor, particularly in the medical therapy arm. And you can see in the medical therapy arm, having moderate or greater TR uh, indicated a worse prognosis. The mitral clip seemed to kind of eliminate that prognosis, although there was no significant interaction. Both groups did better with mitral clip treatment. And finally, in a fascinating analysis that Howie Herman did, looking at the impact of post mitral clip gradient, uh, we, we obviously want to avoid mitral stenosis after the mitral clip. And the mean number of clips that were used were 1.7. Uh, the mean uh, discharge uh, TTE mitral valve gradient was 4.2 millimeters. You know, we try to avoid 5 millimeters or greater, but the range actually was 1 to 13.2 millimeters. So there were some very high gradients uh, of, in the mitral treated patients. So we looked at the outcomes according to quartiles, and you can see here the mean gradients in the quartiles, and, and the fourth quartile of patient had a mean gradient of 7.2 millimeters, as you can see here. Nonetheless, looking at death or heart failure hospitalization rates, it was absolutely independent of the different uh, quartiles. Quartile four is the yellow, and you can see they're right with the rest of uh, uh, the other patients. So looking at a cubic spline analysis, looking at discharge, 
mitral valve gradients from anywhere from zero to 10 or so. You can see these relationships are linear. So at least in secondary MR patients who are really limited by the degree of their mitral regurgitation, it seems as if a mildly increased gradient is a, a, a reasonable price to pay for reducing mitral regurgitation, and those patients will still benefit. So most importantly, a lot happened in the last year in that first, the FDA approved the MitraClip for treatment of patients with secondary mitral regurgitation, pretty much basically saying that we should follow the COAP criteria because in contrast to MitraFR, at least the COAP criteria identified patients that would benefit. And we now have this uh, entering into the guidelines. This is the updated, uh, uh, focused update in the uh, American College of Cardiology uh, expert valve guidelines. Basically, again, saying follow COAP criteria, and if you meet those criteria, then transcatheter mitral valve replacement with this edge-to-edge -edge repair technique is appropriate. So to conclude, what we now have to do is get all the patients treated that deserve treatment, and we've got to avoid treating patients who who aren't going to benefit. And we did see that there are such patients uh, who don't have severe MR or whose ventricles are too far gone or who you're not going to get great results in, for example, from mitral FR. So to get the widespread utilization, but in the right patients, we first need the evidence generation, and we now have that. We now need FDA approval and an indication, which we have in the United States. We need guidelines adoption, and that has now come. But to complete the picture, we need reimbursement. And actually, just within the last week, uh, CMS has released their final uh, guidelines for final commentary. And so probably within a month uh, to two months, we will have reimbursement in the United States for these treatments. Um, this then requires a heart team approach to these patients, and that's actually going to be in the reimbursement guidelines, including uh, surgeons, uh, echocardiographers or expert imagers, general cardiologists, uh, referring docs, and heart failure specialists, as well as the interventional cardiologists to make the right decisions for these patients. And that will allow us to achieve nationwide improved outcomes and hopefully global outcomes for heart failure patients with severe MR. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, so let's move on to our last talk before our discussion session. This is going to be, be given by uh, Vinny Lepak. He's going to talk about tricuspid valve interventions update device techniques and evidence in 2020. Uh, it's nice to see everyone and uh, very interesting talks which preceded this. So hopefully this is also interesting. A uh, couple of challenges with tricuspid regurg, as we already know that uh, the regurgitant volume not only is dynamic and volume dependent, uh, but patients generally present with very vague symptoms. Uh, they generally are speaking have been well managed with heart failure colleagues and the main reason being the surgical options were pretty limited, means most of us probably will hesitate to take on a re-op tricuspid, just isolated lesion, although the, there's a dramatic increase in tricuspid repairs uh, when we are doing a concomitant surgery. And there's again a very poor understanding of grading, like we generally grade any valve disease as mild, moderate, severe, and there has been an effort on tricuspid to see uh, whether we need to grade it a bit differently. Uh, the therapy has challenges as well because the tricuspid is very delicate valve structure, very ill-defined annulus, and we already know that from some repair interventions. And further, physiologically, we still don't know uh, eliminations better than reduction and which patients we should aim to eliminate TR and uh, in which patients we should just uh, um, reduce TR. So the first step was uh, an attempt to, you know, grade tricuspid regurgs differently. And I think this was predominantly driven by the fact that some of the repair technologies which we use uh, seemed that at the end of the so-called tricuspid repair, uh, the TR was still severe. And I think this is uh, uh, probably driven by that. And we saw that the patients benefited despite reduction, uh, but the end result was still severe. Uh, multiple approaches, tri transcatheter repair approaches are essentially based on many old and new surgical approaches. Uh, this could vary from DVEG annuloplasty or annuloplasty with a ring or clover technique or K-plasty. And just uh, easy to just classify them according to annuloplasty techniques, or annular modification technique, 
leaflet devices which could either increase cooptation either by edge to edge or by a spacer uh, we have seen some uh, i would say heterotopic wall implants such as cavern wall implants and of course uh, ttvr which is a really emerging field uh, these are the timelines for tricuspid and we are going to see many more technologies probably covid actually has given us a breather in terms of uh, slowing down this in a way to analyze this properly so let's quickly look at certain annular devices and ironically although trialine uh, which was based on case repair as you can see it really worked well in some patients but as i mentioned earlier that tricuspid annulus is pretty fragile and ill defined and i think with this technology the main issue was uh, pleasure tears and technically difficult however when they managed to modify technique with two pleasures uh, this did work very well in selective patients so there's still future i think in this technology uh, this was the first case reported as you all probably know uh, this uh, was significantly better uh, annuloplasty is widely used in surgery and hence we have seen now two attempts at annuloplasty Uh, i would say the many more but predominantly what we are aware of is cardio band which was designed for mitral now being used for tricuspid uh, as you can see that it's a incomplete band so it actually might work very well in tricuspid but currently the main handicap of this is imaging poor annular definition prolonged case time and lastly but not the least is the length of the band as well because i think majority of tricuspid which we see in practice are pretty big in terms of dimensions so we are going to see more about this technology whether it uh, survives or not in the current fashion or whether it needs modification uh, there are some out of box concepts like uh, tri cinch concept this is annular modification rather than uh, annuloplasty and this is based actually on hetzer repair uh, who was the chief uh, in berlin and essential idea is uh, put an anchor uh, on the anterior annulus and then pull it towards ivc to increase cooptation and essentially physiologically bicuspidization of the valve uh, leaflet devices i'm not going to go more into details of forma but uh, in selective cases it did achieve good result uh, this device after second generation has been now withdrawn essentially it was the spacer technology which we saw initially in mitral then tricuspid Uh, but probably it's uh, it's end of the road treatment rather than uh, elective or selective treatment uh, this is just a case example from columbia university of a patient with a really good result at end of nearly 3 years uh, there are of course uh, based on mitraclip experience this has now been as we know trilumina trial is ongoing uh, there have been a lot of off label cases reported in terms of tricuspid um, and we we can we can see that this has been done concomitantly with mitral regurg uh, there's still some definition required in terms of which leaflets we are going to approximate how many clips we use and more importantly uh, imaging has been challenging and there are hearts such as horizontal hearts for example where it's extremely difficult or presence of another processes uh, such as aortic processes can limit the use of this technology in its current form but again we are going to see results from trial unit to define which patients really benefit from this and which patients actually don't uh, pascal again on the same uh, line has h2h uh, technology which is very similar to mitraclip really uh, in terms of physiology and hence uh, nothing more to really add in terms of that so what about orthotopic uh, heterotopic implants we saw some early uh, enthusiasm about uh, sapien in ivc or some uh, uh, you know uh, design valves which are essentially for this uh, this is one of the cases where we have used a z stent we have in, in fact done some hybrid things as well but these are again palliative i think more than this is just to reduce pressure in the lower part of the body and manage the ascites and renal venous hypertension in a much better way uh, this does have some hope i think in future because it does decrease the preload once you implant this but we need to understand the physiology much better to use this finally but not the least is that tricuspid valve replacement therapy now in my mind this is actually more promise on tricuspid than most of the repair technologies and the reason being we don't have to redefine classification of tr we don't have to you know uh, go and define more indices to show efficacy 
this definitely eliminates TR. And we have got now four devices and few more coming uh, with first in man experience, the largest being, of course, of Navigate. Um, there are three approaches. Uh, I think the two approaches which will survive are the IVC approach, because a lot of these patients have a very big IVC, and transatrial approach in uh, some cases where the anatomy is challenging. Uh, this is just a case of, uh, just to show you how a transatrial is done. Uh, this was the case of Navigate we did in Colombia some time ago, and just a small pursing, non-rib spreading incision. And in majority of these patients, we use TE, mm -hmm. so general anesthesia is of course given. Uh, this is the end result. I'm always impressed by end result of TTBR. I mean, this is just impressive. Uh, this was a 91-year-old patient uh, who still is living after two years. Uh, now, transfemoral therapies are coming. And just to give you a quick example of an intrepid transfemoral, uh, you can see two different cases, one in presence of a ring. Uh, as the delivery system sizes are going down, uh, such as in evoke tricuspid, I think the trial is going to start soon. Uh, we are going to see more promise in this technology. There are some unanswered questions still, such as need of anticoagulation, for example, and durability and ability to do wall in wall in future. But that's uh, design specific in my mind, and I think evidence will show where we are going with this. So I think what we have learned early is patients do present with a lot of TR. And these are the patients which are currently, I would call as high risk or compassionate kind of cases. Procedures are relatively safe because, you know, do no harm is the main principle. Uh, majority of the repairs tend to achieve a reduction in ROA in selective patients. I think durability of those is still unclear. And I think the next step, I think, is we are going to learn more about RV physiology, RV reserve, uh, what are the impact of, uh, you know, pacemaker leads which are there, whether repair is better or useful than the replacement in some patients. So I think we are going to learn much more in the next coming year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for great lectures. And I think it's time for our discussion session. So uh, if you have questions, you can just unmute and ask. Or if you want to uh, go into the participant panel, you can also raise your hands and then we can call on you as well. So in case you have questions that you don't want to interrupt other people. So, uh, well, Amar, you, you want know, to get started have, with? Yeah. Yeah, but, well, we have such a huge, I mean, uh, the, the panels, obviously, we've talked and uh, we are moderating this, but there's so many things that we've learned. I mean, one hour giving us a complete right <laughs> through, uh, through what's what's happening. And there's so many, so many questions. We just have to make sure that we limit ourselves to important questions. And I would... <clears throat> you know, give the panel, uh, you know, the first questions because uh, they have been quiet and, and looked. So why don't you guys start? Maybe David, uh, you should start. Sure, I'm happy to. The, uh, uh, th those were some spectacular uh, lectures. I was really going to make, you know, more of a, you know, a, a set of a couple of, of, of comments about things that I thought were most uh, interesting or important to me and um, really, uh, Sticking mostly on the on the Taver side because the other side, the the tricuspid stuff is so new, um, but I think on the on the Taver side, I think the the area that was emphasized in several of the talks and um, I think is one that is going to be dominant for the next uh, decade is this whole idea of of lifetime management and how are we going to um, actually uh, plan for all these patients and I think it really is um, uh, you know critical and the. You know, the one question that really comes up in the in the idea of lifetime management is, um, you know, should the management strategy, should any management strategy that we're thinking about for a lifetime with TAVR uh, involve the likely need for valve explant? Um, and I would like to, you know, really maybe direct that uh, uh, to the surgeons on the panel um, who have the most experience to John and uh, uh, Vinny uh, to really take that on and say, you know, talk about a little bit about the challenges of valve explant and whether you think uh, that's, you know, is, is it realistic to think of a strategy that, uh, you know, the last step or the second step is a valve explant followed by a, a, a SAVR, or should we really be, um, you know, focusing our idea on strategies for doing, you know, SAVR first and then multiple valve and valve implants if that's what's necessary. So I'd like to hear from the surgeons about that. 
Well, Vinny. Thanks, David. I'm, no, I'm not actually. Don't. I'm not. I'm not actually a surgeon, so I'm. <laughs> I was wondering about that. But that's no, okay. I didn't. What he, what he meant was John Lee. Uh, John, John Lee. Sorry, I didn't mean John. John. Oh, James. James. yeah, <laughs> that's James as well. Yeah, James. James. So, uh, as you know, that Tower Explant is, of course, a possibility, and initial uh, uh, feeling was that is going to lead to root replacement and a very large, horrendous operation. So. We have initiated actually an international registry and we'll be presenting it at both uh, TCT, hopefully, and London Valve. Uh, the initial results, I can tell you, are not that bad. There is always a learning curve when we do these things. And uh, Janye, please add to that. Um, just broadly speaking, uh, the taller devices are more challenging in terms of uh, taking them out from the aorta, uh, but easier because they're nitinol based to remove from the annulus. Uh, balloon expandable and mechanically expandable are shorter, but they're harder to disengage from the annulus because of the sheer mechanical expansion of it. So we have to be careful about uh, damage to mitral valve, conduction tissue, etc. So interestingly, uh, of course, it's a possibility. And in my mind, actually, that might be better uh, because let's not forget that Tiver in Tiver is great. Uh, I'm not saying it's not, but if you are going to put this patient on anticoagulation because of the just the burden of the stents, uh, then might as well do a mechanical wall in my mind and leave them alone for life. So I would like to hear from Jan A what his experience has been. Hello, uh, uh, yeah. I agree with uh, with uh, with uh, Vinny. I think uh, the the question is whether we should do a heavy first or surgical. Well, first, uh, uh, as a surgeon, I think uh, when we move to the young patient as a surgical mortality and the risk is pretty, pretty, pretty low and minimal, and the mortality almost close to zero percent in the young patient, the house patient. And uh, I think uh, my personal opinion, I think should a surgical valve first, as the reason is because uh, it's a redo, uh, I think in the long term, like after 10 years, probably will be quite a difficulty compared to the after one year or two years, particularly for the long standard valve, I think it will be uh, make a difference. And another thing I think I need to uh, make a little caution is uh, in terms of coronary reaccess, because it uh, also depends on the which valve you use after the valve TAVI and TAVI. So the surgical valve, generally speaking, is a coronary access after the you know, valve valve. Generally speaking, is still the accessible uh, in majority situation. So I think, uh, you know, another thing that I think uh, for all the surgeons very really important is things is uh, if the annulus is small, is the sinus is or cell is small, I think should do a root enlargement, make the future valve valve is feasible. So I think that's very really critical for the surgeon. If the, the surgeon just uh, put a valve in as a, you know, for the convenience, that can be a, uh, issues for the for the uh, savvy and the tavy. So I think the important things depend on the first valve, how, how the surgeon did. So that's my so opinion. Yeah, so James, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, very briefly, come back to what, what John said with PPM. I mean, the, 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 the sign that, or the, the thing that you said is the surgeon should do a root enlargement. That is actually not new, but we also know that this additional time, additional skills, and unfortunately, not many have done it. But if you look at what uh, what John said, that you know PPM, severe PPM, obviously impacts on on late outcome. It looks like you know minimal or moderate PPM uh, does not. Is there any any concern from either one of your sides or any one of the panel? But I mean, I would like to say that I mean, mo moderate PPM, these results are very early. And we, what data we are discussing currently for wall in wall is high risk patients. I don't think we can uh, pr you know, extrapolate that for patients who, can, who are intermediate risk or low risk with longer life expectancy. Uh, I have a slight hesitation in terms of uh, applying that data because as we know that initial wall in wall experience although it has become common now uh, has predominantly been in patients where we feel that the life expectancy is not going to be that long so sure it maybe probably doesn't show that and i'd like to hear view from john and others as well about that 
Well, I think moderate PPM maybe over a lifetime maybe matters, but if you really want to avoid that, then you might be better to get in a situation where you're doing a TAVI and TAVI as opposed to a TAVI and surgical valve, That's uh, which is going to have the, the most problems with PPM. I guess I think really down the road, the question is going to be who's going to do the procedure uh, partly uh, rather than uh, than which procedure. If you do a TAVI and you put in a valve that uh, where the leaflets extend above the coronaries, it may not be repeatable. If you do surgery and you uh, get a very large valve in, but you don't enlarge the root, it, it may not be treatable with a valve and valve procedure. So we can talk in generalities, but it, it matters so much who does the procedure and the choices that they make at the time of the first procedure. And I think that that's, that's the critical thing uh, when we're treating patients. Yeah, thank you, have John. Longevity. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, Zhangmin and uh, Kentao, you know, you have been dealing with aortic insufficiency. We have been messaging about aortic insufficiency. So it's your time now to talk to uh, Patrick and to Samir about your concerns about, you know, valves that are currently available in Japan and the United States and hopefully in Europe uh, and challenge maybe what he said. One my question is, uh, I think the, <clears throat> the diagnosis of uh, the parallel leakage is very important because according to your ROC curve analysis, uh, the, if, uh, if the, uh, the severe PVL is, uh, has a low instance, the, the detection accuracy of uh, the PVL is higher. So the, but the, nowadays, uh, the, the risk of severe parallel leakage is very low, only 1% sometimes less than 1%. So in this current situation, how to apply the, your the dense dormitory in the contemporary uh, practice? This is my question to the Dr. Saray. Yeah, I think that you, you're right. I mean, uh, that's what we call the average treatment effect. I mean, you take a global population, you come with uh, 1%, 2%, 5%. But uh, if you can identify these uh, 5% during the procedure and act immediately on it, then you are doing something good. And that's what we have uh, collected over the time. It, it is published, is having these uh, direct access to a measurement, which is the sum of all the jet, because... Uh, you know, have been in the call up for uh, uh, ECHO for a long time. Uh, first, the jet, which are posterior, are not easy to quantify. Don't forget that uh, Becky Ann, uh, Philippe Barrow, uh, Weinsmann has published the uh, Kappa value for uh, regurgitation, which was 0.47 with uh, four criteria and 0.54 for uh, seven criteria, seven class. That's clearly indicate, I mean, I've watched these people for a long, long time. Uh, there is some, uh, some lack of reproducibility. And uh, the fact that uh, you can identify that directly the procedure and act on, and in many, many time, act on is just the post dilatation. So I think it's, it's something simple uh, it has already been implemented. I think it's it has some value, but I would yeah. agree with you that. Uh, it why, tend why just focus on the moderate to severe? Even mild is not as good to have. So I think with the current goal to be perfect, we want to be not even live with the mild AR. So even mild AR bugs me, and I post dial it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we start to look in between the, the 6 and 17, and there is also, it takes more time and more patient, but there is also a price to pay, even if you have something mild, yeah? And something mild, which is a very local, apparently, it's just preliminary, could have some impact on uh, either conduction defect or arrhythmia. Um, Dr. Hayashida, uh, any comments? Yes, yeah, cool. Yep. Thank you so much for your presentation. Actually, the dense metering method seems to be really good for the quantification of the PPL. But sometimes the patient may have the reduced renal function. So uh, how much can you uh, minimize the amount of the contrast 
follow your method? So very, how much do you need? Yeah. Very good question. I mean, the point is that uh, if you are a non-synchrone injection, okay, then you could need the 12, 15, even 20. But what we have done is that we have made a, a selective injection during the uh, systole, yeah, uh, and diastole. So it's a trigger injection. And then we reduce the amount of contrast to 8%. And uh, we compare that with the uh, 12 of 20. Uh, we did that uh, in patient, but we did that also in, in a very smart uh, animal model. We took, uh, you remember, the wall stand for the peripheral. We put the wall stand partially uncovered so that we had 5 mm, 6 mm, 7, 8, 10 of uh, lack mm -hmm. of cooperation because the stand. And then we quantified the regurgitation with this injection of 8 ml versus uh, 20 and got the same result. So I think that it's uh, really feasible. Don't forget that densitometry is the product of density and surface. So the parallax effect is gone. You can take an, an egg uh, in plastic field of contrast and turn in all the projection. The surface will become small, but the density will increase so that the product is a, is a constant. So 8, 8 cc was enough in all these cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Thank you. So, Greg. Yeah. Um, you know, we have Greg and uh, Samir um, left a little bit. Uh, and, and Alan, I take the privilege because Greg gave us an incredible insight uh, on, on, on new, new data and unpublished data. And, um, you know, the question obviously is, are we having resolved the issue of secondary MR now? Or in other words, I know your answer, but I hopefully <laughs> put yourself into a little bit of a different role now. What would be what would be the challenges for future devices? Because we all know it is a very good device. Both uh, both clips. I mean Pascal and, and and the clip. Are we done now, or are you giving other technologies a chance? And if so, they have to obviously compare themselves to uh, to the clip. That won't be easy. Otherwise, they won't have a chance. Would you agree to that? Yeah, well, well, first of all, um, you know, co-apt applies to a relatively mod small population of patients with heart failure and secondary MR. And we've seen from MITRE-FR that if we uh, extend too far away from our indications, that there may not be benefit. And in addition, if you look, even in the MITRE-CLIP group, there were a lot of events, a lot of deaths and heart failure hospitalizations, even among MITRE-CLIP-treated patients. So we need to look, first of all, if we can treat earlier, <clears throat> if we can demonstrate that um, whether it's moderate degrees of MR, but in patients who don't have any left ventricular uh, dilatation yet, don't have pulmonary hypertension yet, et cetera, might benefit, or patients with severe MR who are asymptomatic might benefit, those are gonna require uh, randomized trials. Uh, and I definitely think, you know, one of the downsides of both MitraClip and Pascal is that it uh, permanently deforms the mitral valve complex, if you will, by you know attaching permanently the leaflets. So that does limit future surgical and other options. So I do think that there may still be a role for other mitral, transcatheter mitral valve repair and certainly replacement uh, um, uh, devices. Transcatheter mitral valve replacement in particular is very exciting because it will eliminate mitral regurgitation and probably 95% plus of patients. And that may lead to better long-term outcomes. And we've just got to demonstrate uh, either compared to MitraClip eligible patients compared to the MitraClip or to compare to ineligible patients compared to medical therapy, whether the effectiveness of those devices warrant uh, any of the safety concerns. Yeah, I, allow me to be uh, humbly uh, to be of a different opinion about mitral valve replacement. Um, I, I'd like to put that aside. You know, when you say we have to attack a little bit earlier before the left ventricle dilates too much, would you think we do have we do have uh, technologies such as Ankara and cardiac dimensions with an earlier stage, uh, less invasive, um, uh, if you wish? Um, would you think that these uh, devices actually may play a role <coughs> before you come to the uh, 
to the later stages? Well, yeah, it's possible. I mean, one of the nice things you, you've described, either direct or indirect annual plasty or ventricular basal um, ventricular plasty devices. And the nice thing of that, about that is that that doesn't interfere with future options, either future edge-to-edge -edge repair techniques uh, or, or transcatheter mitral valve uh, replacement or surgical techniques. So that's possible. Uh, and CORE, as you know, is moving mostly towards heart failure, not necessarily towards severe MR. Um, cardiac dimensions is undergoing a pivotal trial right now, so it'll be fascinating to see those results and yeah. the portion of patients in whom it's applicable to, given its indirect uh, um, approach and potential for circumflex compression, et cetera. Uh, but yes, it's possible those might be very good uh, techniques for earlier uh, therapy. And also, of course, uh, you know, even cardio band or uh, millipede or more direct annuloplasty approaches. Although the problem with annuloplasty, of course, in the surgical experience is that there's been a higher recurrence rate. So a lot of moving pieces, and we'll have to see how it all works out in the next five years. Uh, I, after I agree 11 years. With... Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying that I agree with Eberhard that one of the challenges to see is that when will we do mitral valve replacement? Because early technologies that, as you described, for 2 plus MR or early intervention like uh, Ancora or cardiac dimension is outstanding. But again, on those patients, you will not do mitral valve replacement. And if you are going to go to a late stage where people have really poor ventricle, again, putting a big mitral valve uh, may be detrimental to those patients. So uh, it's going to be a fairly fine line uh, to say the patients who are not ineligible for mitral clip uh, would be the patients that we would take for uh, mitral valve replacement. So this is going to be a, a very difficult clinical investigation to conduct because how we enroll the patients, how we do it. And currently we are facing this because right now we have already the tendine, we have already other valves that are being randomized against uh, conventional treatment. So this and, is not a... With the... yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Could, no, no, go ahead, Samir. I don't want to... So I, just my point is that it is a, it's a difficult area uh, to sort out that how different therapies will fit in. I think less risky therapies have better chance than, pe and, than therapies that have more risks involved uh, in the future. Well, and, you and, know, I, and that, if I may say, go ahead, no, I was going to say that's the real beauty of um, what we've seen in COAPT uh, with the MitroClip and what I anticipate we're going to see with Pascal. It's a very safe procedure. And it's yeah. really going to be hard to uh, uh, compete with that. So you're going to have Absolutely. to be substantially more effective. And also, of course, with TMVR, you're going to need chronic oral anticoagulation for a certain duration of time. So there's going to be bleeding. And so the, the effectiveness is going to have to be pretty profound uh, to find the right patients for that technology. And, uh, you know, for that one second before I come to or we come to Samir, and his talk. Just to play the devil's advocate, we have two surgeons, two wonderful, brilliant surgeons. I, you know, just to play John the Wett. opposite side, but we are trying percutaneously to do a trans a mitral valve replacement with all the inherent risks that we are seeing uh, on uh, on the past. Uh, you know, many many mitral valves have been. Uh, resting in peace. And now, you know, you have one CE mark and it goes very slowly, uh, mainly only because you want to do it. Um, and then Apollo is moving very, very slowly. So I'm, I'm asking myself, uh, given all the billions of research, why wouldn't you admit that surgeons are still not our enemies? They are our partners. And if we can say we can do a minimal invasive or transatrial safe implant on the on the mitral side uh, with not all these issues related to, uh, leaks, migration, uh, thrombosis, and, and all of this sort. Why not reducing that a little bit and concentrate more on repair than you know spend millions of bucks on uh, on trying to do what the surgeons can do now safely? minimal invasively uh, using a transcatheter approach. <laughs> Silence. 
No, that not, <laughs> it's not silence. We are just being polite to each other, Everard. Uh, <laughs> I wanted Janier to start, uh, but uh, very quickly, I mean, you know, uh, the results of co-op Greg showed are amazing, but it has taken 15 years. Uh, the trial took six years to enroll, and now what we have seen actually is a lot of patients coming back, and we are operating more and more mitral cliff failures as well, because. Greg, Greg showed really nicely the stepwise approach, but I think the one point which is not emphasized at present, and I'm not talking about expert centers, is which anatomies are good as well. We are focusing on differences in mitra FR and co-op based on physiology, but we are not emphasizing anatomy very well. And what I've seen is a slight lack actually of clear definition. So. People say, yes, of course, it's very safe, so let's give it a go. And in fact, uh, this is another reason why another registry has re recently been floated. Uh, and, it's, and it's going to show that, again, we need to define and educate people in terms of choosing right anatomies as well. And I think uh, probably Janay, Greg, and Samir, you can pitch in as well on that. Because that's another very important piece, because otherwise we are going to see a lot of misuse of this uh, very successful technology. I, I agree. Oh, sorry. sorry. I Samir. agree with, uh, with, uh, with Vinny. I think uh, first uh, we, we are talking on the mitral regurgitation. First, uh, we have to separate the function and, uh, and uh, structure. That's very critical. And for the degenerative uh, uh, valve uh, disease, I think the repairs uh, is definitely you know, superior than the replacement. So for the for degenerative valve disease, I think a trans I think a trans catheter uh, probably is a less low, particular for the for the replacement, it's because the 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 surgical repairs outcome is uh, definitely superior. But in terms of functional regurgitation, I think uh, I agree with the Greg. I think uh, the mitral clip is uh, so you know uh, uh, safe and uh, the complication is so. Minimal. I think the the, the player probably has a major role in the functional uh, mitral regurgitation in terms of transcaster mitral valve replacement. I think that's the very difficulty to as uh, as uh, Samir says, uh, how to define the patient, the which patient will be a benefit of the repair and which patient the benefit of replacement, particularly for, for functional mitral regurgitation. Even on, on the surgical side, still we are not sure which patient there will be. A, a benefit from you know which technique. So I think uh, that uh, uh, for the future transcaster mitral valve therapy, I think uh, probably will be quite a different from a tavia, and it's more complicated. I think is a is a relatively limited to a some very specific patient, rather than the, like a tavia will be a extended you know indication so quickly. So I think that will be a long way. To go uh, for for the for the uh, broaden this kind of technology. No, and I Samia, completely agree. I, I just wanted to highlight two points that the mitra clip for functional MR for degenerative MR. To be honest with you, it is a simple procedure, but for a functional MR to do a mitra clip is very artistic. It is very very difficult to know how the scallops are how the annulus is, what is the motion of the annulus, what are the leaflet lengths, how the leaflet coapt with each other. If you put a large clip versus small clip, how the coaptation line will move, how the scallops will open or not, how the gradients will develop. So I think that it is, as uh, Vini rightly pointed out, that the anatomy and the expertise will be so different for functional mitral regurgitation for edge to edge repair that it will be extremely difficult to generalize this kind of approaches uh, to the general community. So I think, uh, again, how we liberalize these efforts to the different parts of the country and different operators is also going to be challenging, especially with edge to edge repair. Now they call it TIER. I was surprised by this acronym, but the new acronym that Medicare put for the mitral valve repair is TIER. You know, I feel like crying. But I think we should we should argue against that one because this tier is I think crazy. 
Well, so let me respond. So Tier, for those of you who have not seen, this is from the new CMS uh, uh, determination to reimburse it, is transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. And I think they did that because they, they say, well, that's where the evidence is today. Obviously, once we start getting competitive technologies that show they're as good or better than edge-to-edge, -edge, then they'll expand that. Uh, but I did want to agree with Vinny that, uh, you know, the MitraClip is very technique related. Um, it depends on the expertise of the operator in terms of patient selection and being able to get a good transcatheter repair. Depends on the expertise of the imager. Um, uh, but I will say the same is also true for mitral valve surgery. I mean, even if you look at the uh, guidelines for mitral valve surgery, uh, you know, a lot of them depend on the ability, especially for degenerative MR, on being able to, you know, get a good repair in, you know, 95% plus greater cases. And frankly, there may only be 30 really great mitral valve surgeons in the country. So I think all these techniques are very expertise dependent. And when we look at our individual centers and local expertise, that may carry the day, depending on the relative experience hands of the surgeon and interventionalist. No, I think uh, yeah, Greg, that's a really great point because as you know that a lot of discussions have happened over the intermediate risk trial. And, uh, you know, I, I can quote Dr. Craig Smith, uh, who I respect a lot. And he said, Vinny, you know what? Maybe our results are not as great as we think. So I agree with you that, you know, selective results are good. Uh, my emphasis was actually on uh, better education in terms of, uh, you know, liberalizing the technology, because that's where the real win is, I think. Uh, I'm actually more skeptical about uh, CODA replacement and all those technologies, uh, transcatheter yeah. technologies. Uh, I don't know how long it will take and how, uh, how can they demonstrate probably safety against uh, edge to edge. Yeah. So, guys, we no. have to... Yeah, never mind. Let's, let's uh, wrap up. Much. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the time. Uh, Samir, you have been uh, very kind. Yesterday, you were very engaged in the, uh, in the clip. So uh, uh, we appreciate you in, your input. And thank you. Uh, Alan had to go and work. Uh, so I guess um, I all wanted to thank you very much for your fantastic input. It was a tour de force, uh, you know, in one hour going through everything that's important now with excellent speakers. Uh, and uh, I hope that our future participants and the, uh, the auditorium will find this equally important and instructive. Thank you all very much for attending this. Hopefully, uh, you know, we will see each other, as John said yesterday, in the distant future. I hope in the not too far distant future, we will see each other again. Be well, stay well, and uh, let's hope that you all uh, come home safely or be home safely. Um, let's hope that this nightmare is going to be over soon. Thank you very much again. And of course, Jung Min represented the, uh, Korean, uh, the Korean organizers. Thank you very much. Good luck in the United States uh, in these days and a safe return to Korea at some point. Thank you very much, guys. I Thank think you. Uh, we have to close. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.